World Inside coming to you from Beijing on CCTV News. I'm your host, Tian Wei. On today's program, the IMF includes the RMB in its reserve currency basket, marking an important step towards making the Chinese yuan a leading world currency. And a wild adventurer, Robin Davidson, shares her experience trekking 1,700 miles across Australia's western deserts with just the four camels and a dog. What day is October the 1st for China? Well, it is the 67th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic, which means most Chinese people get a week-long holiday, not only in this country, but also around the world. And this year, October the 1st, also marks a special start for the RMB. It is the first day that the RMB is included in the IMF's reserve currency basket. The move is a milestone believed by many for the renminbi and marks the biggest change to the IMF's reserve currency basket since the inclusion of the euro back in the year 1999. So how will the move affect China and what does the global economy have to gain? Finally, the RMB takes its rightful place at the IMF. Starting on October 1st, the International Monetary Fund will hold five currencies in its reserve currency basket. The newest reserve currency, the RMB, will carry the third biggest share, just behind the U.S. dollar and the euro. That's a big change since the IMF held four currencies. The euro took the biggest cut. The move marks the first time an emerging market currency will be held on par with the currencies of the world's major advanced economies. The renminbi's inclusion uh, is clearly an important milestone in a journey that has begun months, if not years ago. A journey which is a transition towards more market-driven principle of the macroeconomic framework of China. The IMF's reserve currency basket, or SDR, is itself not a currency, but represents a claim held by IMF member countries on which currencies may be exchanged. Put simply, the renminbi will now be officially available for loans and repayments for all 189 members of the IMF. China has waited a long time for this day and has been preparing for the move since last November, when the IMF Executive Board made its decision. Many hope the RMB's new status will help turn the UN into a freely traded international currency. In the future, Chinese companies could do fundraising with renminbi more easily. Financial risks will be reduced. Those who travel overseas will enjoy lower exchange costs. It's a milestone for the RMB. Efforts to internationalize the currency began to speed up seven years ago. The RMB is the fifth most active currency for global payments. But as exciting as it is to be included by the IMF, the RMB still has a long way to go. China needs to speed up financial reforms in order for the RMB to become a major reserve currency in practice. The RMB's new status at the IMF is just the beginning of a long journey ahead. For more, we are joined in the Beijing studio by Professor Liu Baocheng, Dean of the Center for International Business Ethics at the University of International Business and Economics. In Southampton, we are joined by Mr. Mike Bastian, Senior Teaching Fellow at the University of Southampton. In Washington, D.C., we are joined by Mr. Nicholas Lardy, Anthony Solomon, Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Gentlemen, welcome to our program. What do you make of it? I mean, eventually, RMB become part of the basket. It is happening on October the 1st. Mr. Lardy. Uh, I think it's a very important step forward in China's uh, domestic financial reform because to have the RMB included in the SDR basket, uh, the Chinese uh, financial system had to have a number of adjustments, more liberalization of the exchange rate, liberalization of interest rates, uh, providing access to foreign investors to the interbank uh, domestic bond market. These are all extremely important uh, reforms related to the domestic economy. So the way I look at the inclusion of the RMB in the SDR basket, it's really the domestic reforms that were necessary for the IMF to approve the RMB inclusion. That's really what that's really the most important thing to keep in mind, in my opinion. Mm. Professor Liu, what do you think, China's perspective? 
I think it's a, a milestone step forward uh, because uh, uh, about a couple of years ago, China's application for the inclusion was really rejected. And now that you know, uh, it is approved, it shows that uh, China has made substantial progress mm -hmm. in converging more to the uh, MAP or global standard in the liberalization of the Chinese financial market, mm -hmm. not only in the uh, management, but also in the operational uh, side. So uh, I think that can really back push China. You know, people compare uh, China's assertion to uh, WTO and how much uh, impact it can create on China. Mm -hmm. So now the uh, uh, inclusion can also uh, create a huge impact to push uh, China to uh, further reform its financial policy wow. and also to open more to the global financial services. Professor Bastian, of course people would compare that to, to WTO, but uh, many would say it is very different, and the significance of it is also very different when it comes to the degree. Uh, do you agree? I, I think I do. I think it's very significant for, for the, the, the main reason that more RMB will be freely available. Uh, the, the Chinese currency will be recognized as a genuine international currency for international payment transactions. So what, what's really most significant here is just how opportunistic and how um, eager the Chinese business community are to expand even more successfully internationally as a mm. result of this the opportunities that this will bring I think that's what's what really needs to be discussed here at, at a microeconomic level uh, it, it's the Chinese business community and their um, the, how well equipped they are and, and how much they can capitalize on what I foresee as a, a real major boost to I their see. international market opportunities. But 10.92% of the overall foreign exchange basket of the IMF, and Mr. Lardy, how much difference will that really make for the Chinese businesses starting from October the 1st? Well, I, I think we have to recognize that, you know, the RMB has been increasingly used in international transactions and trade uh, over the last several years. So uh, a currency does not have to be in the SDR basket for, for traders on, you know, on both sides to agree to, uh, to carry out their transactions in, in a particular currency. I mean, for example, the Canadian dollar is not in the basket, but there's plenty of trade that's carried out uh, between Canada and other countries that's denominated in Canadian dollars. So mm -hmm. the denomination of trade transactions uh, really can proceed somewhat independently from the uh, whether or not a currency is included in the basket uh, or not. At the margin, it may help, but we've learned over the last few years that uh, one of the major factors influencing the use of the RMB is the expectations of both Chinese importers and Chinese exporters, uh, you know, what's going to happen to the value of the RMB uh, over time. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, if you're a foreign uh, exporter into China, you're very happy to get paid in RMB if you think it's going to be an appreciating currency. On the other hand, if you think it's going to be a depreciating currency, you will be quite reluctant to accept payment in RMB. So the, the use of the RMB in trade is influenced by quite a number of factors, uh, and whether or not it's in the SDR basket, I would say, is, is secondary. Hmm, interesting. Professor Liu? Yeah, I think, the, of course, you know, having said all those uh, important significance on, over a long-term basis over the macro level, but uh, uh, on the uh, macro level, uh, eligibility does not really lead to popularity uh, in a way that, uh, okay, you know, with inclusion into the SDR, uh, Chinese RMB is more eligible for uh, uh, as a reserve currency or as the currency for uh, settlement. But its popularity needs to be earned over the uh, liquidity, over the uh, Chinese uh, continued export drive and people's demand, mm. and particularly how stable and transparent the Chinese financial policy will remain after the commitment to the SDR basket. Right. It seems that the Professor Bastian, the other two gentlemen have very different views from you, at least as to how much the Chinese businesses can really cash in. Mm. 
Yes, and I, I, I think it, it really is, it's an intangible factor that, that needs to be discussed. It, it's not easy to, to, to measure. It, it really it, it depends on the interpretation of, of Chinese business leaders, maybe across industries and, and, and how they feel about it. Mm -hmm. And I think it also needs to be said that, that whilst this weighting stands at 10, I think it's 10.92 percent, um, the ch China's quota um, the, the, the maximum amount of uh, funds stands at only 4% and its voting power at only 3.8%, whereas right. the U.S., um, the quote, I think, 177 the, the, the voting power 16 point something percent. Mm -hmm. so, so the influence that China will have, again, is, is, it, it is not reflected in that, that weighting. But, but again, I come back to the point that we need to see and we need to measure just how Chinese business react to this and hopefully gain in self-belief and confidence and, and realize that the international opportunity is there now because their currency is recognized as one of the five most important. Is there a danger of over-optimism? Well, I do not think so. Uh, given that China still maintains the largest uh, uh, creditor around the world, and we have here uh, the continued trade surplus, and uh, uh, right now we are uh, still at the beginning stage of mapping out our global strategy to internationalize the RMB, mm -hmm. you know, with more offshore centers, swapping agreements, sign, etc. So uh, I think with the endorsement of IMF. Uh, the most influential global uh, financial institution, mm. and so China does not only have this, uh, a better say in the uh, uh, reform in the international financial market, but uh, uh, more importantly, it really gives more confidence for uh, all investors and traders right. to to use the RMB and Chinese uh, companies uh, in particular because they feel that they really uh, have uh, have more the uh, of the transaction advantage in terms of the cost calculation. Right. It is not just uh, China uh, with the inclusion of the RMB into the SDR basket uh, in a way indicating itself has graduated from the previous stage of uh, opening up financially to the next one. It is also the IMF trying to justify itself in terms of the degree of reform and the inclusiveness it has become. Having said that though, let me ask you, Mr. Lardy, uh, as we all know, it's not just about the financial issues, it's also political issues. In your country, presidential campaigns going on, debate between the two candidates. One indicated China is quote unquote still the currency manipulator. Certainly the other do not necessarily agree. Obama administration has never said that in its history either. So uh, will currency issue, particularly uh, China's RMB, continue to be a political issue. What would that mean with the good news that the RMB included in the SDR basket? Uh, RMB is becoming, and Chinese financial system becoming more transparent. How should we reconcile these two different stories, Mr. Lardy? Well, I think quite frankly that you know, the SDR is a pretty obscure uh, topic. Uh, most people in, I would say, virtually every country have never even heard of the SDR. And the fact that the RMB is included now uh, in, in the SDR basket is not a major mm -hmm. uh, issue, it's certainly in the U.S. campaign. I can't imagine anybody bringing it up. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a lot of criticism of, of China's trade practices, especially by uh, some of the candidates, I don't think all of it is very well informed, but uh, I, don't, I don't think this, uh, this issue of the uh, RMB coming into the SDR basket will become, uh, become a political issue. And I don't think it was a political issue for the, for the IMF itself. They went through a very thorough and strenuous review mm. to determine uh, that, the, that the RMB, remember their standard is the RMB has to be freely usable which is not the same thing as saying it's 100% convertible on all transactions. It has to be freely usable in international transactions. Right. And after a long uh, examination, they came to the view that it was freely usable, uh, but they did indicate that China should take some additional steps. Uh, China did that, and then they finally voted to, uh, to allow the uh, RMB into the basket. Uh, effective on October 1st. I see. Uh, people see it very differently, of course, in different economies. Uh, it also has a lot to do with uh, how well informed they are uh, and whether they value the current uh, so-called international system, to what degree, 
and uh, how much it has to do with their own economy. So, Professor, let me ask you here in Beijing, um, what do you think? Will Chinese RMB come into the SDR basket of the IMF? And the discussions related to it as to why the RMB could become part of it into the IMF uh, SDR basket, be able to help the discussion from Chinese perspective about so-called unfair accusations from others of China being quote unquote the currency manipulator. Certainly one of the accusations came from the presidential uh, uh, debate uh, in the United States. Well, people can just brush it off saying not necessarily so. But at the same time, how is that going to you know, interact with these kind of things? One is more financial, the other of course is more political. Yes, I think, uh, well, China is uh, uh, making a decision that, okay, on one hand, we maintain our autonomy in monetary uh, policy. On the other, we want uh, the uh, Chinese RMB to be more liberalized and convertible on the global marketplace. Mm -hmm. And there has been a number of attempts to uh, accelerate the uh, liberalization of RMB in its capital account. But uh, uh, given the volatile situation of the global financial marketplace, China really delayed this. But the direction has never changed so far. And also China will, uh, you know, uh, why do we compare with the assertion to WTO? It's not really the high significance in terms of the, uh, you know, the uh, global assertion, but mm. rather more it is a similar equation to uh, back push China to accelerate its financial reform because even right. the domestic investor, investi uh, investors and traders, they are also eager to see that we see more liberalization to reduce their uncertainty in their business decision making. Now that with the free trade uh, zones now spreading, so we hope that this can really be rolled out together with the drive of the commitment uh, to the uh, uh, inclusion of the basket. Mm. Uh Mr. Bastian, what do you make of uh, China's uh, RMB and the direction it is uh, headed for? There has been devaluation of currencies worldwide in order to seek an edge and advantage in international trade and exports. Mm. Now, how has China's RMB been doing so far and the attitude coming from Chinese uh, central bank? What do you make of the, all the latest development? I think in general, and this is consistent with the, the, the central government's um, almost renewal of the Chinese economy, more modern economy where Chinese companies are competing on quality, on, on premium brand, uh, emotional brand image, that they are very, very concerned that the currency is not used um, as it perhaps has been in, in, as a weapon in cost uh, advantage and, and price competitiveness. Mm. So I think the direction that we'll see is uh, a very carefully managed uh, currency exchange rate, but I don't think we'll see um, dramatic depreciation and the maintenance of um, a currency exchange rate, the RMB with the other major currencies that mm. gives Chinese companies automatic cost advantage. I think they've realized that that in the long term is not a good thing and Chinese companies need to stand on their own two feet right. and compete on quality, investment, uh, and that's the way I, I see the, the currency going. But Mr. Lardy, it is a very widely practiced uh, uh, method these days for economy to devalue their currency. So what do you make of this uh, trend? And what do you make of this trend at the same time the Chinese is trying to, at least it, at this moment, stabilize its uh, exchange rate system? Well, <clears throat> there has been some very modest appreciation of the currency, uh, both against the dollar and on a trade-weighted basis, over the past year. But it's been quite, uh, it's been quite modest, and I certainly agree that uh, the government is not using currency depreciation as a method for <clears throat> boosting its exports. Mm -hmm. And I think, quite frankly, one of the reasons is China's exports are doing very well relative to the rest of the world. Yes, they're not growing very rapidly, uh, but global export growth has slowed down dramatically. So we saw in 2015, for example, that China's share of global exports increased quite significantly. Uh, so we're in a different global environment now where trade is growing much more slowly. 
But China's trade is holding up very well as a share of global trade. It's even actually expanding. Mm. So there's no real economic rationale at the current uh, situation to try to use depreciation to boost up the exports. I think China's gaining market share globally based on productivity, uh, quality improvements, and so forth. I see. Professor Liu, what's next? I mean, OK. As China may believe uh, SDR basket has be a big issue, particularly to boost yeah. the, uh, the morale here in this country as to more transparent we are getting. But at the same time, what about the financial reform? Uh, with the uh, supply side reform and together, you know, the uh, financial market and financial regime will have to reform, and it is really placed on the top agenda. So. The inclusion of the uh, into the SDR box market is just the beginning of the trigger mm -hmm. to uh, back push China. And not, now we have widened the corridor for fluctuation, and uh, so we are aiming at further liberalizing the Chinese uh, uh, currency and uh, devaluation. Uh, the uh, sort of deregulation uh, is a on uh, ongoing process that is uh, definitely going to happen in China. Mm. And what about you, uh, Mr. Bastin? What's next? What do you think might be the biggest obstacles for China to further push its own financial reform, more transparency, and putting the country more on the market <laughs> economy footing? Uh, again, I come back to the microeconomy, and I think that the central government will be monitoring very closely the further expansion, the international expansion of, of Chinese companies mm -hmm. and the building of their corporate brands, their product brands, so the likes of Huawei, Lenovo, uh, and I think we'll see more and more, and how successful they are on the international marketplace and the influence that will have on uh, mainland Chinese companies' business culture. And, and if they're convinced that that really is changing, and, and I think it is, then we will see further liberalization and, and a, a far more uh, comfortable approach to allowing the currency to find its own level according to market principles knowing that Chinese companies can compete um, uh, not just on price but on quality and, and premium branding so I think again mm. that's the key the international performance of Chinese companies Mike Bastin Liu Baocheng Thank you so much for being with us, and also our appreciation to Nicholas Lardy, who joined our program earlier. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for being with us. Stay with us here on World Insights. Still to come, a wild adventurer, Robin Davidson, shares her experience trekking 1,700 miles across Australia's western deserts with four camels and a dog. Welcome back. You're watching World Insight. Imagine yourself traveling alone across Australia's western desert, cut off from all the modern conveniences. You wake up to the sunrise and fall asleep under a star-filled sky. That was Robin Davidson's life back in the year 1977. The so-called camel lady trekked 1,700 miles with her dog and four camels. Earlier, I had an opportunity to sit down with this extraordinary woman to talk about how her desert trek changed her perspective on life. But first, this background story. One woman alone in the desert. When Robin Davidson embarked on her ambitious journey across the Australian outback, she didn't think it was that big of a deal. Then 27-year-old Davidson spent the vast majority of the year 1997 trekking across the vast Australian continent with only four camels and her dog. She suffered many hardships along the way, suffering from dehydration, tending to sick camels, and overcoming cultural differences with the Australian Aborigines. With the help of National Geographic photographer Rick Smolin, but much to her reluctance in the beginning, the journey was captured in vivid color and detail. During the trip, Smolin came out to meet her on several occasions. Davidson eventually made it to the Indian Ocean, where she took her camels for a triumphant swim. It was the end of her journey. But she would spend the years that followed sharing her story with the world, first in her best-selling memoir, Tracks, and later in the big screen hit of the same name. You know, if you put yourself in that vast landscape and you're on your own, and you're walking day after day after day, 
you do change, your consciousness changes. So even though I hadn't really thought that that would happen, I hadn't expected that to happen, it was very, very good when it did. Your relationship with the camel, mm. they all love you. Mm. They want to sleep with you. Yes, they did. <laughs> and they want to follow you. Yes. They're still stolen your food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they were very easily bribed by handouts. Yes, they were. Just like kids, right? In Rather a way. like kids. Yeah. I would put them on a uh, sort of intellectual level with maybe five or six-year-old children. Um, they were very funny. They were very witty. So, for example, at one point in the journey, I'd let them go, and Dookie came back around behind me and took my whole head in his mouth. <laughs> now, what he could have done is just crush my head, but he just sort of held my head like a helmet and then took his head away and sort of leapt off like a joke. It was a joke. Mm. People look at you very differently because people feel you and us. You mm. are the adventurer. Yes. What do you think about this divide? I've always said that I would, want, I would want people to see what I did as something applicable to their lives. And I don't mean by that that they should drop everything and cross a desert, obviously not. Next time you go, you let me know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> by the way, it yeah, may not right. be a bad thing. No. <laughs> but that the metaphor of the journey, that is that you can do something outside of the expected or the conventional. Um, you can be bold, you can take on a challenge, and it doesn't matter how that manifests in your life, the principle is the same. And by doing that, you grow, you evolve. And um, really, I don't think we do evolve until we take those risks and start testing boundaries. The other thing to say about the luck of the journey was that I came across an old Aboriginal man, or he came across me rather. Mr. Eddy. Mr. Eddy. And this extraordinary thing happened, an unprecedented friendship across a, a great cultural gap. And for some reason that I'll never know, he decided to come with me for a month during that journey. And that provided the heart of the journey for me because I learnt such a lot from him uh, even though he didn't speak English and I hardly spoke any Pitinjar, um, he taught me how to actually be in that desert. Before I'd met him, I'd had an alarm clock. Can you believe it? I had an alarm clock. <laughs> and I put the alarm clock on at night, and if I didn't wake up when the alarm told me to in the morning, I'd feel terrible Protestant guilt. And I think what he forced me to do was get rid of the old... Um, sort of uh, the old cultural attitudes City that were cliche. yes that weren't of any use to me out there so that i could then proceed to become more integrated into the place i was in how can you be more integrated as he taught you after i left him um even though i was as remote as it's possible to be from other human beings i have never s felt so um linked to everything, so at home. So the paradox was that um, I was extremely alone, but absolutely not lonely. Um, whereas in the past, I could be surrounded by people and quite lonely. Give me an example. Is that about a tree, about the dog, about the four camels, about the little boys and girls you saw in the Aboriginal communities? the one who was surrounding you? No, it was more to do with when I was completely on my own. It was a, a sensation of being at home in the world. That's what I would say. The stripping away of uh, the, the kinds of qualities that I needed uh, in the urban environment, stripping that away to become at home in a desert environment and being alone, that was quite difficult. But what was more difficult was coming back into my own culture. That really was profound culture shock. And in some ways, I think I've never properly come back. What was it like for you when you, quote unquote, came back? When I ended that trip, two weeks later, I was in New York um, after having been alone for nine months. So I was walking through New York thinking, this is, this is insane. This is insanity. This is, these people are in mad. They're mad. Um, 
And I think it's very good to have had that perspective on my own culture as well. Uh, it's made me always question the normal. What do you think are the basic textures that we need in our society? What do you think are the things that we can simply throw away, just like the alarm clock? Well, of course, now it's being connected all the time. Um, and it's very, very difficult now to disconnect. It's almost impossible to get beneath the radar. I think it's becoming illegal to get lost. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, I think, you know, right through human history, there's been an impulse to disconnect, to to go on some sort of metaphorical journey, if not a real journey. Um, and it's, I think, deep in our psyches to, to need to do that in order to come back a, a, a better person or a stronger person or a different sort of person. People are constantly in a state of distraction and it can't be good. We have to have an alternative to that. Um, I don't mean to totally disconnect, but to at least take time to regenerate one's individuality away from that noise of distraction. Indigenous peoples with a culture under threat. Australia's Aboriginal peoples were the sole inhabitants of Australia for 50,000 years. They used to live in small nomadic bands living the existence of hunter-gatherers. After 1770, British explorer James Cook's arrival began a two-century process of cultural obliteration. Disease, capitulation and forced integration. Today, Australia is home to half a million Aboriginals, less than 3% of the total population. Few have learned to perform an Aboriginal dance or hunt with the spear. But many anthropologists credit Aboriginals with possessing the world's longest enduring religion as well as the longest continuing art forms. But many fear that the traditional Aboriginal way of life is now, by most real measures, all but extinct. How do the Aboriginals mm. in Australia mm. look at families? And what about um, their tradition about families yes. to you? Well, family is much more complicated in Aboriginal communities. Um, they're nomadic, inherently nomadic people. Um, hierarchy is not important. Um, so it's a level, very level society. But everyone is related to everyone else in some way, which means that you know what your duties and responsibilities are to each person in the each person you come across you will know what's expected of you what's not expected of you um, family of course you know aboriginal culture at the moment is is under great pressure there are huge social problems um, what are these alcohol social social disintegration it's the aftermath of colonization um, there's a lot of disease illness and I think it's terribly hard for younger people mr. Eddie was of an older generation so although he'd seen terrible things he still had the old ways to fall back on to for his identity he was still very much a traditional person Whereas I think for younger Aboriginal people, it's terribly difficult to find their way um, between those old ways of being and what they have to deal with in the modern world. And uh, some communities are happier than others, um, but generally speaking, it's, it's a tragedy that is still unfolding. What are people doing about this? Do you think that's sufficient at all? Or actually, as they say, cultures sometimes just disappear. I would hope that's not true. I think that Aboriginal culture was a truly great culture. I think of it as I think of the Greeks. Um, What's comparable? The myths. The idea that everything in the universe, in the cosmos, can be contained within one grand theory of everything, which is the dreaming. It's like a huge poem, so it's both stories and poetry and song and art and human relations and how to be a good person and how to survive in the landscape. 
um, how to look after everybody so that no one goes hungry. They solved all the major problems and they did it with nothing. So it would be a terrible, terrible thing if that way of thinking disappeared forever. What about with Mr. Eddie? The way you got to know him, the way the trust established, and later your interaction with him or his family. He took me along a segment of his dreaming, which means his totem. So as we were going along, he was singing the country as we went. How sweet. Oh, it was, a, I was so lucky, so privileged, because that man was living really as his ancestors had lived for hundreds of thousands of years. And yet we met and sort of understood one another. It was like a love affair, I guess. It was a kind of love affair. And in fact, when I went back to see him the first time... Uh, that was when? Uh, that was a, like two years later, something like that. I discovered that he'd made me his wife. <laughs> <laughs> How could he make you his wife? How did that happen according well, to tradition? Well, if you go into a if you go into an Aboriginal community, you will be put into some sort of category, what they call a skin category. Um, now, normally, he should have made me his sister or his daughter or his daughter-in-law, something like that. The fact that he made me his wife was a much more intimate bond, obviously. Um, and when I arrived, I didn't know what that might mean. <laughs> it was a slightly awkward couple of days, uh, but it was fine. Um, but it meant that I inherited his family. So his son is my son, even though my son is older than me. Mm. You've been a global nomad, I would say. So why repeatedly? Well, I've never is done a, a journey like that again, but I did become very interested in nomadism because of my time with Aboriginal people. And I started to think a lot about about the fact that how we move, how we move from place to place, how we set up a home or not set up a home, affects culture, how we th think. I realised that in the modern world, those traditional forms of nomadism are disappearing very, very fast. So that whole way of thinking and being in the world is vanishing. And I ended up uh, very sad to see that way of life going because it made them um, I think they were true, truly cosmopolitan people because they had to negotiate with difference all the time. Mm. As you just said, they were compromising already. Their original ideas and strengths just to be alive, mm. to keep their original yes. way of yes. life. And yes. yet, wouldn't that make the original life losing its original flavors? And therefore, is it still worthwhile? I think it is still worthwhile. And of course, no culture is absolutely separated and pure. Yeah. Uh, we're always changing and negotiating. Um, but I think the fact of their movement is what makes their way of being in the world different from settled people. And that is what ultimately will change for them and will make them just like everyone else. What do you think would happen to the nomads? Worldwide, It will end. It will definitely end. I think we're losing something fundamental there. That's what I mean. It's not just uh, sort of decorative. It's fundamental. Miss Davidson, such a pleasure to know you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you. Mm. That is all for today. If you'd like to see more of our program, visit our website. Just type in World Insight, see CNHB News into your search engine. You'll be able to find us. Or you can also check out our YouTube channel. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching and tune in again next time for more insights from across China and around the world. Good night.